Well, welcome everyone. Uh, on behalf of the Management Committee of the International Association for Bear Research and Management, um, Carl and I want to welcome you to the next presentation in our series of webinars geared specifically towards bear management topics. Today's presentation is titled Bear Viewing at McNeil River Falls, a must for bear biologists, and is presented by Carl Lackey and John Hechtel. So with that, I'll pass it over to you, Carl. Well, thank you, Dave, and welcome everyone that was able to make it. Last summer, I had the privilege of visiting McNeil River with uh, John Hechtel. Bear viewing, especially at McNeil, is not something within the realm of most bear managers simply due to the expense and other logistics. I'm fortunate to have a wonderful friend who for several years has been telling me he was gonna send me to McNeil. Steve Morrill and his wife Beth have been supporters, not only our bear program here in Nevada, but they've also donated to and supported the IBA and many other wildlife conservation efforts around the globe. They have supported our use of Corellian bear dogs, having bought a dog from my colleague Becca Carniello here in Nevada, and one for Rich Bosley in Washington. Steve was supposed to visit McNeil with John and I, but had to cancel last minute. However, he is attending this webinar, and uh, we have a special announcement at the end. So thank you again, Steve and Beth. Little bit of a background, McNeil was established in 1967 as a sanctuary. And then in 1991, the Alaska legislature expanded the sanctuary uh, into the McNeil State Game Refuge. And I'll, later on, John can mention some of these other folks that played a hand in this. Now, one of the coolest things for me, and I would imagine it would be the same for most bear managers, was to see the mix of bear behaviors happening in different areas of falls all at once. Aggression, tolerance, cooperation, passiveness, you name it. More on that in just a few minutes. Now, if you've been fortunate enough to travel with Hector, you probably already know this. Going anywhere with him is akin to going out to dinner with, with somebody like Robert Duvall. John kind of has that star status. And if you've been around long enough, you just know who he is. Okay, just a little perspective on where McNeil is. It's on the southern end of the Alaska Peninsula, about 200 miles south of Anchorage and about 100 miles southeast of Homer, uh, accessible by float plane only. The camp at McNeil sits at the mouth of McNeil River, right next to the sound spit, uh, sand spit, sorry, that shelters McNeil River Cove. And that cove is where the float planes like to land. Flying directly above the falls, uh, is restricted, at least at low elevations. But as we approach and search for landing, you can see plenty of bears at the falls, as depicted in that lower right hand picture there. Now, after landing and our taking our things to camp, but before we even had a chance to unpack, these two three and a half year old cubs walked up the spit from the mud flats to investigate with mom. You can see her there in the background digging around in the for clams and things like that. Now, Beth Rosenberg, the area supervisor, stood in the way of these very persistent cubs. Beth and the other sanctuary personnel, Nick Duell and Greg Colligan, kind of enforced an invisible boundary around camp, usually just by getting in front of these, these young bears. But they occasionally use what Beth described as the nuclear option. And I thought this was hilarious for spook and brown bears, but it was just a tin cook pot filled with pebbles. And as soon as she shook it, this little guy, the real, real persistent little male, took off running. That in the 50 plus years of people coming to McNeil, no one has ever been injured and no bears have even ever been killed or even shot at. 
And this is a testament to the way that McNeil was managed. Restricted access and very small numbers of people. Consistent human behavior because of the management of McNeil helps develop and maintain that tolerance. I'll explain more on that in Camp Life in just a few minutes. So we hiked, hiked to the falls each morning starting around 9 o'clock. Not an early morning start by any means. It is roughly a one and a half mile, one way, very leisurely walk with an elevation gain of about 20 feet, give or take. Hip boots or waders are mandatory. And we are walking by bears or vice versa the entire trip, which took almost two hours to go that mile and a half. Now, not only because we are pausing for bear photos along the way, but because we proceeded slowly through the, uh, the alders when you get closer to the falls. Uh, going through those alders real slowly, pausing occasionally just to prevent spooking any bears. Our first glimpse of the falls was from just about 150 yards away, and I thought that was pretty cool until Nick said, oh, no, we're going down here where that black arrow is, uh, to the paths, these gravel paths. And there's a good shot of the upper pad of where we were and just how close you are. Now there's two pads, upper and lower. Where John is sitting there, that's the lower pad. And you look at that picture on the right and you can see the people on the lower pad. I'm taking that picture from the upper pad. So one just sits right on top of the other. It's not uncommon for bears to use the same path as we were using the using to walk in between the pads. And this one is just sitting right next to us a few feet away, watching the other bears fishing just like we were. And just just for perspective, that first little stream out in front of us was 17 yards away from the uh, from where you're sitting there in that lower pad. Now, think about all the bear interaction that you've seen in your career, other than females with cubs. I would imagine for almost all of us, it would be extremely limited, as most of the bears we see are individuals, as bears all by themselves. Now, think about watching 30 to 40 bears interacting with each other for six or seven hours a day, and with bears as close as two to three yards away from you, out to about 100 yards and all while sitting there relaxing in a lawn chair. Sounds crazy, but it sounds like a heck of a good time to most of us. Now, are these bears habituated to people? In a way, yes, but as John put it, there are levels to habituation. Some are tolerant of people and some not so much. But the lure of the food makes them more tolerant than they may really be. It was as if we didn't even exist. Some of these bears are new to the falls, and I asked this question while we were there. They act in a way that I assume means they are taking cues from the other bears, the more experienced bears. These newbies may stay on the opposite side of the falls for a while, but that's still only 100 yards away. Eventually, they come in and get close and closer. Now, the coolest thing for me was, was to observe all the different bear behaviors and fishing techniques and knowing that this is exactly what they would be doing anyway, regardless if we were there or not. Now, for future reference, you can click on that YouTube link there. It's an older video, but it's, it talks about bear behavior. It was made by a guy in Alaska, so it's pretty good. Tolerance between the bears and sizing each other up is common. And even though these guys have fresh bite and scratch wounds, we never really saw any serious encounters. Just a lot of posturing and vying for those good fishing spots. Obviously, as confrontations do regularly end in physical contact, but more often than not, well, jawing like these bears are doing, or vocalizations and subtle head movements 
serve to diffuse the situation, most situations. And when I say you will observe hundreds of bear bear interactions on a trip to McNeil, I'm talking about all these subtle interactions between individuals. Beth described this perfectly when she said these subtleties, like putting their head down, eye contact, jawing, or sidestepping, are all indicative of rank and hierarchy, both establishing it and consistently reinforcing it or being subjected to it. As for fishing techniques, mutual tolerance is easily the most common behavior we observe. It meant being able to fish in a preferred spot without getting injured. Much of it tended to be bear specific, or a lot of it did. Much like these guys, these two who tolerated each other at very close distance. But that wouldn't necessarily translate to other bears of similar size. They would only allow a couple of different bears to fish in this spot. As soon as they walked up, other bears just left. Stealing fish was another technique, or at least trying to steal. Once a fish was caught, most bears would quickly leave the falls with their catch and try to eat in peace. Some bears would watch for other bears catching fish and then would immediately follow them out of the river, out of the falls to intimidate and try to steal the catch. There were some bears that kind of specialized in this. And then there was begging. This guy had the begging technique down. He would army crawl, start at about 20 feet, 30 feet away, and army crawl up to other bears, many of which were a lot larger. And then he'd just sit there a few feet away, a couple feet away, until when it seemed the bear with the catch would simply get annoyed enough that it would just drop what remained of the fish and walk away. We watched this bear do this a lot. Then snorkeling, you see that bear snorkeling there. Here's another good video of a bear snorkeling. Not all bears would snorkel, but it seemed to be the preferred method for a few. It made me kind of think, are these fishing techniques learned or something like this taught? I don't know. But it was very interesting to watch bears do this. Now, I only saw this one bear using this technique, diving, at least for more than just a few seconds. This guy comes up right now. This guy would be underwater sometimes for over 30 seconds, 45 seconds. And then jumping, just jump into a pool. <laughs> this seemed kind of like a, well, here I go, hope for the best type of fishing technique. It didn't seem to be very productive, but we did see him catch fish occasionally. Now, almost all the bears at the falls were adult males for obvious reasons, but this female with her two and a half year old cubs were there every day that we were there. The cubs acted like young little mobsters, their, their power being and the protection they had for mom and because there were three of them. They could kind of stand their ground and they pretty much dominated this little corner of the falls the entire time they were there. Power in numbers. Now, if they were the mob, this guy was the kingpin. Beth and the crew named him Chops and they estimated him at 1,400 pounds. He'd be a candidate for winter of Fat Bear Week if he was at Brooks Falls, for sure. It was very interesting to watch how the other bears reacted to Chops. He would take off downriver occasionally throughout the day following this one particular female. Can't remember her name. He'd be gone for a couple hours. But as he returned, the others would turn and watch him, even though he was still, at times, a couple hundred yards away, downstream. I doubt they could smell him. Then as he got closer, they would just move like oil and water. This guy was definitely the, the kingpin. And this is a just an interesting shot I got of this is the begging bear that specialized in begging. I'm not sure what he thought he was doing here. 
but he stayed in this pose for a solid minute, just frozen. I was waiting for him to reach out and kind of smack the old dude on the butt. That never happened. Eventually, he just backed off. Beth said that some of these bears have been coming to the falls for over 20 years. Sanctuary personnel take hundreds of pictures from different angles of individual bears over the course of the salmon run each year. They can identify these bears from one year to the next, noting that any physical changes and, of course, behaviors. But like I said, they've documented individual bears coming to the falls for over 20 years, which I thought was really interesting. And an experience that I think every bear biologist should put on their bucket list. You get to see bear behavior in a whole new light. Now, there are other viewing areas that may be easier to access, like Brooks Falls. Well, obviously, one of the main differences between McNeil and Brooks is at Brooks, access, viewing, and the numbers of people are not restricted. It's not uncommon to see a line of float planes like this. You would never see this happen, like this guy walking out into the falls. You'd never see that at McNeil. So, a little bit on the permit process. Just getting a permit is difficult, especially if you're not an Alaskan resident. They award permits through a lottery system only, and only 185 are issued each year. <clears throat> each permit is for a four-day slot, and there's a maximum of 10 people for each of these slots. With some, you can you can actually get a permit for for standby. <clears throat> On all, and, the, and normally these permits are not transferable. That's the reason when when Steve couldn't make it, um, no one else could take his spot. Now, because the float planes can only come in in high tides, their ability to pick up or drop off is somewhat limited. Therefore, you must bring everything with you that you will need for a week. This includes food, excuse me, food, camping gear, photography equipment, and yes, even your own toilet paper. The all also must be very frugal in what you are bringing as the total weight of all passenger and gear is a limiting factor for the float planes. We totally lucked out with the weather, as you can see. It only rained hard one of the six days. This gives you an idea of kind of the, the camp layout. The outhouses up there in the upper left, staff house, the uh, some of the tent sites, the cook cabin, but off to the right there where you can't see, there's many more tent sites. For a lot of years, like most of you, I've been preaching to people, especially in the Tahoe area, to use electric fencing to keep black bears out of things they, that bears may find interesting. And it just amazed me at first that neither the campground, the food shack, cook shack, or our tents were electrified. It seems crazy with a thousand pound brown bears running around. And Beth said that even chops had uh, in years past had been right through camp. Now this beach where Beth is kind of facing off that young male, three and a half year old, that was just 40 yards from my tent, which is right here. That invisible boundary that I mentioned earlier, it's kind of hard to patrol an area that size. And there was one morning we had fresh bear tracks on the path to the outhouses one morning. Well, speaking of outhouses, there's Two of them. And of course, like any good humored biologist, uh, McNeil personnel decorated the outhouse walls with all the Gary Larson cartoons about bears eating people. Well, McNeil is not without luxuries. Here's a couple photos of the sauna. Uh, Beth or one of the guys would heat that big 20 gallon pot on top of the wood stove 
that heated up with the water from that little pond outside the front door. Take a couple hours to heat up, and then you could go in there and bathe and get cleaned up while enjoying the sauna. One of the many luxuries. Now, the cook shack is equipped with gas stoves and an array of cooking pots and utensils. But if you go, you need to bring your own plate, bowl, and utensils to eat with. Because, again, because of the weight restrictions in the float plans, most people bring freeze dried meals snacks and drinks but you got to keep you gotta keep in mind you got to bring enough for a week john and i splurged one night and we had chicken chicken quesadillas and a glass of bourbon now the cook shack was also a gathering place as well we met some very nice and very interesting people like matthias breiter if you look him up he's a world-renowned photographer and biologist who helped me figure out my uh, borrowed camera. And then there was Carol, Carol from Tennessee. John will remember her. Her and Hector argued over, of all things, who had the biggest whale lice in their collection. I never knew of such a thing. But they both had a whale lice. They wanted to know who's, whose was biggest. And I'm not sure who won that argument, but in the end, Carol now has dibs on John's skull when he dies. There you go. Now, there's other, lots of other wildlife to see at McNeil, too. There have been several sightings of a gray wolf just prior to us uh, getting there. We never did see it, though. But there are river otter, beaver, seals, fox, and lots of birds, including eagles. Kind of a wildlife photographer's dream spot, really. And of course, bear photography. More bear photography opportunities than you can imagine. And this was going on constantly, even when I, while you were at camp. You could walk out to that edge there on the spit and, and uh, take photos of bears out on the mud flats. And a lot of this was happening at less than just a few yards. This guy's walking up the path right now where, where we would walk in between the paths. You can see all the bears in the background, too. So, now if you want a chance to go to McNeil and support IBA, and at the same time, um, you only have a few days left to buy raffle tickets uh, that shuts off on April 7th. You can go to the IBA website, bearbiology.org, and get them. You can get them on the, the uh, McNeil website and the Alaska Zoo site, or you can scan this QR code. I imagine John will have some more things to say on this. I just like to say thanks to, to Beth and Greg and Nick for, for uh, an excellent job and a wonderful experience. Um, something that I'll definitely never forget. And of course, thanks to John and then Steve and Beth Mora. Uh, and with that, I'm going to pass it over to John. I'll quit sharing here. That's, my, that's John's size 14 boot print. And this is out in the mud flat. So that's not even a big bear. Okay. John, you want to add some stuff? Um, um, I, I think you did a great job of uh, can, sort of summarizing the McNeil program. Um, I'm open to questions and everything, but uh, as I've told people before, when I first was in Alaska, and even as much as I love bears, I didn't go to McNeil for a long time because the trade-offs of the cost of going there versus escaping in the winter to someplace warm. You know, I always thought, oh, I've seen plenty of pictures of bears, plenty of video of bears catching fish. And, uh, you know, <clears throat> I didn't feel the need to go. I thought I had it figured out. And when I first went there, 
I thought, I can't believe I haven't tried to get here as often as I possibly can. It's a it's a fantastic experience. It's a wonderful place, even without the bears. It's semi-wilderness, but not really roughing it. Um, you've got beautiful setting, beautiful sunsets, bears around all the time, other critters. And uh, But as Carl mentioned, one of my things is I've seen a lot of people and biologists over the years who interact with bears in very specific kind of situations, uh, such as catching them in a trap, darting them out of a helicopter, and then just uh, nowadays even just looking at your screen and getting the GPS locations coming in and not having the time to develop a feel for bear behavior, body language, starting to understand them. And I think, you know, I mean, I know some bear biologists who are probably would be afraid if they bumped into a bear in, in situations outside their comfort zone. And I think, you know, I'm a strong advocate of biologists having naturalist skills and being able to be good observers and have chances to watch bears interacting. And as Carl said, the amazing thing about McNeil is it's pretty much, you're pretty much seeing what would be going on if you weren't there. Um, there is a little bit of impact of the human activities for sure. You know, there are some bears who stick close to the pad where the people are because other bears avoid it. But most of our impacts are pretty subtle and you get to see an incredible uh, variety of, of behaviors. You know, one of my goals is to try to I would love to have every bear biologist on the planet get to McNeil uh, and spend four or five days in amongst the bears and seeing how that process works and get a, develop a better understanding for habituation uh, and some of the other things and bear behavior. Um, so ultimately, i am tr been trying to work on getting a regular program to do uh, what Carl and I were, were able to do. Now, one thing I want to mention is we've got this raffle coming up for McNeil tickets. Uh, and it's going to be for two tickets to McNeil. And it's basically all your expenses except for food from Homer, Alaska to McNeil and back. Because it's like 900 bucks a seat just to fly out to McNeil, a round trip seat fare and things like that that are covered by this raffle. And um, the <clears throat> so from this standpoint, you know, as Carl mentioned, most of the time when you apply in a, in the regular lottery, the tickets are not transferable. But one really amazing thing about this raffle that Alaska Zoo and IBA are running is those tickets are transferable. So if somebody wins them, there's a possibility that the winner this year may say, you know, I can't really use them uh, in late July for whatever reason. And so any people who are interested you know, bear biology types, I want to have a, a standby list or, a you know, a stand in list in effect that if there's an opening for these two slots, we can this year, we could actually do a random drawing of the people who can commit to go if uh, the lottery winner doesn't want to use it. So if that's something you're interested in, and I, I want to talk to Carl and Dave about sending an email out to, to collect the list from the manager's committee, I'm going to try to do the same thing with IBA members. Uh, so there is a possibility this year uh, that that could happen. But I think starting next year, there's the, to apply for a special scientific and educational permit. I think Fish and Game seems to be open to uh, allowing some biologists from IBA or bear managers to uh, apply for those. But in order to do that, you got to apply by the 1st of December. So a little later in the fall, I think we're going to try to work out some kind of a deal for people who are interested uh, to facilitate applying for special permits as well. Um, but the nice thing about this raffle is it's pretty much paid for when you get to Homer. And so that's a big deal, although it's still there's still an expense to get to and from Homer, uh, Alaska. Along, along those lines, John, uh, Steve Morrow, who was on this webinar, him and Beth have committed to doing for another bear biologist what they just did for me. Um, it would probably be through the regular permit system, as you mentioned, with applications doing December, uh, and then a visit to McNeil in the summer of 
uh, 25. But they want to kind of do what, the, what they did for me in all expenses paid trip uh, to Anchorage and uh, Homer and down to McNeil and uh, that whole bit. And uh, I think what all we need to do is decide uh, how we will end up choosing that person. We can discuss that later, but yeah, Steve, just a huge thanks to you and Beth uh, for for doing this, not in your all your support. Yeah, that would that would be that would be wonderful because, like I said, I think it's a, I mean, I think it really is a life changing thing, and I, you know, I've come to the conclusion you you go there with a bunch of regular people, and I've been there over the years a number of times with other biologists, and I think <laughs> the biologists are even more impressed by McNeil than the average person who just shows up and thinks it's a good opportunity to take some pictures and do things like that. You know, those of us who have spent years trying to understand bears and how much time and effort it takes to get some of that, uh, observe some of those things. Normally, you know, you get to McNeil and it's like, it's, you almost have to laugh because it's so crazy how much you can see and absorb about bears and bear behavior at that place. So, yeah, no, I really appreciate that because that's, that's on my kind of list of things that I really would like to do is try to find opportunities to get some biologists out there on a regular basis. So. Yeah. And we've got two questions or a couple comments in the, in the chat, but I'll mention real quick that those gravel pads that you saw sitting on, they're roughly, six feet by 14 feet 15 feet and there's five or six of us sitting down in lawn chairs side by side and you've got the the coolness of the weather we were fortunate we had some sunshine um and you've got the white noise of the falls constantly just the roaring of the falls and it's not um it's not uncommon uh to take a nap <laughs> yeah beth at one point told me just to lay down she she said yeah just lay down over there and you're late uh, keep in mind they keep they have the bears or they keep the bears off the pads but they're allowed right up to it so they can walk on that grass right up to the pad they're not allowed on the gravel and when we the very first day we got there nick reached down grabbed some little penny sized pebbles and put them in his pocket and i just looked at him i said that is that for the bears he goes yeah he stands on the on the upper pad and just kind of keeps keeps view but uh if a bear acts like it wants to get on on the lower pad or come up on the the upper pad he just tosses a pebble at it and hits it and he says that's all that's required to keep bears off of there and i i Thought I put it in here, but I failed to do so. But Beth had sent me a picture of her taking a nap on the upper pad, and there's and people are taking pictures because there's a bear a couple feet behind her uh, eating on a salmon, and uh, she was snoozing. It was a great photo. Dave, you want to handle the? the yeah, chat? that's awesome. Yeah. So, um, uh, the question from Rachel. Says I'm curious about the human habituation aspect. What was it like for you from day to day? John, why don't you answer that? Because you you talk to me a lot about about habituation. Um, you know, I've been doing this stuff for a long time, and and our attitudes in the early days, you know, back in the '70s and '80s. You know, the emphasis on, you know, and in, in a lot of places that aren't very well controlled, you know, bears are pretty willing to habituate to the presence of humans. It's a, just a natural response to anything that they're exposed to on a regular thing. But the concerns have always been as soon as they start to habituate to people, they increase the probability that they're going to get hooked on food and exposed to human food and garbage. And it sets a whole nother thing in motion. So for a long time, you know, a lot of biologists said habituation is bad or even dangerous uh, to humans in, in a lot of contexts. And the interesting thing about McNeil uh, is it shows that 
sort of tolerance that bears have to humans and human activities, having grown up, you know, even the 30 some year old bears, their entire life, they've seen this parade of 10 people to and from the falls or at different places. They, they seen the consistent behavior and the lack of food and garbage available around the camp and things like that. And so uh, they've gotten used to it. The one thing, and like I said, from a bear biologist standpoint, that's interesting is the life history of bears is young bears with the female, almost everything is directed by the mother. And some adult females are really good at navigating in and around humans, but as their cubs are with her, they are directed by her. But that period, as soon as they're kicked out, the all the rules are off for those cubs. And if they've been around humans, you know, with their mother, when they're on their own, they are the ones that's come in and start to test things a little bit more. And throughout the life history of bears, that's always been a strength because that's what's allowed bears to exploit new habitats, move into new areas and do things like this, this testing phase where they go in and all the rules are off. When these bears are around people and they've been habituated, that there is a phase in there where they have to learn the rules all over again the 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 because things have changed from when they were with the females so that's where there is an interesting aspect of habituation that you know occurs in that period and we've jokingly kind of called those young bears hooligans um as what we've called them over the years but where they are a little bit pushy where they're a little bit testing things. And the other thing that occurs is some of the bigger bears, there is a bit of avoidance around the camp area. And so this is an area devoid of the more dominant bears. And that can also be a reason why those young bears kind of start to crowd the camp limits a little bit. So, you know, in general, on your day to day experiences, you're, you know, you're moving through areas. And the other thing about it is the staff are very good at not disturbing the bears. The whole purpose of McNeil isn't to have a bear viewing photography experience. It's to protect the congregation of bears at the falls and everything else is secondary to that. So all the viewing activities and all the things, and even walking to and from the falls, we give bears the right of way. We, give them a lot of respect and space and we don't you know we do things very consistently so um that helps that whole habituation thing and you know like i said but the flip side of that is is you know you respect the bears and you give them that but you don't you make sure the bears and especially those young bears also learn to respect humans yeah, so John, that Rachel was clarifying, like, how about you and your habituation to being near bears from day to day rather than the vice versa? Oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> yeah, and Dick, Dick has a comment on that. Dick wanted to answer that, I think. My my raise hand option doesn't work. So, but uh, that's a real interesting question, Rachel. And uh, I guess first of all, I would have to say that just by way of support for for this um, program. <clears throat> you really, you see all the pictures, you see all the movies, but it's not when you really get there, the whole thing just hits you very, very hard about what an incredible place this is. And I can't emphasize that enough, that even though you may not be that interested in originally in McNeil, you'll never forget it once you leave. And so um, just as kind of support for what both Carl and John have said, I've been there twice, luckily. Um, but anyway, I, the the, for the first time I went, I was an employee for Fish and Game. And John and I went out there to kind of back up some folks that were on vacation and, and uh, be guides. And uh, it certainly was, there was a level of situation that occurs fairly fast, actually. From my perspective, John had been there before I did, where you start to really get comfortable around the bears and your expectations of uh, potential conflict drop quite a bit. Um, not that you're ever just totally free, but you, you know, you've, it's a whole different experience. The second time I went there, my wife and I were drawn and my wife who was, was, was and 
probably still is afraid, very afraid of bears, um, was real nervous about what was going to happen. Um, the staff are excellent in kind of dropping down that, lowering that fear level. And I have a great picture of her taken on probably the second day because I think we had sun that day. She's standing um, on the edge of the pad with an adult male or sub-adult male named Ted, Ted literally sitting next to her. If she reached her hand out, she'd be able to touch him. And the smile on her face is is really tells the story. So people go there and they're always amazed uh, when they when they get there and when they leave at the difference in their response to these bears and their attitude towards bears in general. So it definitely occurs and it occurs really fast. Um, well, I mean, within the, probably by the end of the first full day, people are starting to really relax. People that were very, very frightened of bears to begin with. And so I think that that habituation by people is a really strong element of this. We don't really talk about that as much, but I think it is a critical, uh, critical, critical thing for people to discuss how your attitudes towards bears will change so quickly when you're in those position, when you're in that position on those pads and walking back and forth. That's that's it. And I would I would add to that. I, I definitely I've, I've been to McNeil a lot over the last 40 years and worked there and in different contexts. And when I even when I knew it fairly well, when I would first show up every year, there'd be a little bit of a period where I had to kind of recalibrate in effect, you know, my attitudes and my my interactions with the bears. There is an issue of that, though, that I get concerned about sometimes, especially at places like Brooks, where you've got a bunch of unsupervised people walking around. And I think there's a danger of getting complacent, uh, you know, as well when you see these things and you have to be you have to be in situation. You have to, you know, especially as a biologist and or people working at the place to not just take it totally for granted that. You can do anything and get away with anything and the bears are okay. But, but yeah, there's a process that occurs and it reoccurred every time I went back there. The biggest, the most kind of risky or concerning things that were when I was working there leading was I was up at the falls one time and there were two big males fighting right next to the pad. And I wasn't as worried about the danger to us as the fact that they paid so little attention to us during this particular fight that there was a chance that if it spilled over onto you know it could spill over onto the pad and that kind of thing was the, the an issue so there is there's there's a lot of things going on in this place and a lot of fodder for discussion and probably one of the best times i ever had there mike proctor uh kate kendall from glacier and karen noyce from uh, minnesota all biologists were there when we were there and to actually get to talk to other biologists while you're watching the bears and discuss these things is really really uh interesting and fun so um but anyway the habituation on the human side definitely happens there are people that come up there that were afraid that i've seen change but like i said uh it's it's a it's a phenomenal place i mean i can't say enough it's probably one of my favorite places on the planet so another question was uh how does mcneil compare to katmai so whoever's <laughs> done both I, I've done both and I've been going to both Katmai and McNeil since the like 86, I went to both places at the first time and I've watched them change and evolve. And when I first went to Katmai, there was a tiny little platform up the falls and they've kept putting more boardwalk and more, uh, infrastructure there, lots more people coming through. Uh, and I like McNeil for the bear bear interactions and ability the Katmai, I actually, I'm interested in there from the human bear interactions is what interests me and in watching that because it's a lot less controlled. There's unescorted groups of people wandering around. I've seen things at Katmai that scared the heck out of me or I thought there was going to be a problem. Um, but it's a, it's a totally different experience. There's a lodge 
right near the mouth of the river. Um, they've even got lawns around the cabins because it's a private lodge that draw the bears in. And there's this ridiculous show of the bears coming in to try to graze, you know, the staff trying to chase the bears away when if they would just remove the lawns, it would do a lot. But it's it's a totally different thing. As Carl's picture showed, there can be 20 float planes all lined up on on the beach. There can be bears walking down the beach. It's it's fascinating place also but a really di totally different experience and i mean if you have the ability to go to both it's a it's a it's a cool contrast but uh honestly uh, they're both okay but it's the mcneil experience is is such a different thing because like even at the falls uh brooks falls there's a can be a waiting list or, or a waiting line where you have to you know they limit the amount of time each people are on the platform and rotate through and do things like that so um if you want more information you can uh, i'm happy to provide it but but in general it's a it's a really different totally different management approach and um the there's i think there's less concern about the you know i, I i'm I actually think that the impacts of human visitation at Brooks, you know, there's still a bunch of ultra habituated bears that seem to not be caring, but especially with the fat bear week uh, publicity, it's it's even increased already large crowds and there's more and more air charters that are bringing people up just for the day and things like that. So they're very, very different experiences, but both fascinating for a bear biologist, no question about it. There are any, uh, that's it for the chat as far as questions. Are there any uh, questions out there? If you guys want to raise your hand, unmute. Feel free. Well, this is going to end up on the, uh, the IBA YouTube channel here in a few days. Uh, and we'll send out one more big push for the raffle ticket purchase, Dave. We'll do that through the forum. We should try to get Amy McLeod to do one through the uh, student forum as well. Yeah, good idea. I see Rachel said we're looking up plane ticket prices. <laughs> yeah, that's right. She's ready. <laughs> you know, like I said, if if this thing works out, you well, especially the raffle. Yeah, you, you know, you, the nice thing is you just have to get to Homer or even Anchorage. I mean, if somebody from this group got to Anchorage, I could probably uh, kick in a ticket to Homer on miles. But yeah, the, the great thing about the raffle is the, the a lot of the cost is getting to and from uh, McNeil from Homer that, you know, it's $900 a person to get over there and, and to have that covered. Uh, you know, we've got camping gear rental, uh, included in that and your permit fee if you're a non-resident the permit fees a few hundred dollars as well so that's a good deal but um, if we start to get this program going where we can uh, sponsor some bear managers or bear biologists to get out there on a regular basis we'll try to help as much as we can uh, so yeah we went out on the on the Syed scientific education permit which is a little bit different process than if I was just to, to try to go on my own with my family, I'd have a very, very slim chance of, of drawing a permit because most of them go to Alaska residents. But uh, that Syed permit um, was what enabled us to, to get the opportunity last summer. And, um, you know, the Syed permits, you know, I mean, it's a it's a. I used to be in charge of McNeil before I retired or, you know, oversaw McNeil out of the Anchorage and we'd get, you know, reviewing those side permits. And a lot of people who apply for those permits are, you know, film crews or people writing articles and doing things like that. But I, I think the, the program is very, very much open to um, supporting other biologists. And even there's a, on a regular basis, people from other bear viewing areas uh, get an opportunity because, you know, as we all know, 
you know, none of us can get it all figured out on our own and information sharing and creating a community of bear people that can share insights and do things like that is, is really a big part of what we try to do at IBA and uh, through the managers committee and things like that. So um, yeah, we're, we're going to pursue that for sure. And, you know, this, you know, the big barrier to McNeil, as I said, has been the cost, you know, to get to and from there. And I think we can work on the SIED aspect of it. And with some additional support and things like that, I think, I think we can get a really excellent program going. And, and uh, as I said, I, I guarantee you, you know, if you've been working on bears and are interested in bears, it's a trip to McNeil is something that will make a huge difference in your understanding and attitudes. And it's a once in a lifetime thing for a lot of people that that's what I used to say. It's a daily once in a lifetime experience when you're there. Well, this has been great. I really appreciate you guys sharing your experiences. And um, I think it's a really good way to explain how unique and how, what a great opportunity this raffle is going to be. So, Thank you very much for sharing that. Any uh, last minute questions, anything? Thank you, everyone.